Alright, so I have finally, finally, finally gotten finished with reading To Sleep in a Sea of Stars by Christopher Paolini, and this is actually the first book he's written in almost ten years, ever since he finished up The Inheritance Cycle, and I thought, it's pretty good. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Now, I don't have a lot to say about the good parts of this book, unfortunately, because there's just not much to say about them. It's just like, yeah, this bit was fun. I was kind of into the story, I was kind of into the characters, and I, it doesn't go particularly deep. You know, some people might have some sort of deeper enjoyment of it, but for me it was just like, surface level, but still really fun. The problems, on the other hand, are a little deeper. We'll, we'll get into those, uh, especially in the spoiler section, because the, the weirdest part about this is... Look, we'll, we'll get into that. So, the setting for this book is pretty standard science fiction fare. It's hundreds of years in the future, humanity has gone around and colonized a bunch of other planets. Enter a scientist named Kira, who uh, is a xenobiologist, so she works on... Well, she's a biologist for aliens, uh, but there aren't any, like, sentient species of aliens that they've met so far. And one day she's digging at a site looking for some stuff, and then this alien artifact, living thing, which she winds up calling the soft blade, uh, attaches her itself to her, and it's like a mess of fibers which covers her from her neck down, basically, and it feels just like skin when you touch it, but uh, sometimes it can harden itself to work as armor, it can... Uh, form spikes and like stab people and later on she figures out how to do even more stuff with it so it's kind of cool and then other aliens come in start attacking humans and then Kira has to use her newfound soft blade powers to save the day. Now when I first heard about this I was glad that Paolini was one doing something science fiction and two doing something well doing something that wasn't aimed at the same target audience you know this is more adult oriented than Aragon there is swearing there is some sex stuff in there uh, it is a little violent, and it, it doesn't get super, super dark or mature in there, but, like, yeah, it's not really aimed at kids or teens anymore, which is, you know, that's fun, I'm glad he did something different. But while I was reading, it felt a little familiar, and I couldn't quite think of what it was. At first I thought it was just the setting, because as I said, it's pretty standard, you know, nothing really stood out about it to me, good or bad. Although I will say that you know, with all the stuff like faster than light travel and everything, they don't really bother explaining it in the text, it's just the characters know how it works and all that, yada yada. But there is an appendix at the end, so if you're interested you can go in and look at some of the more technical details. Which I thought was a really neat compromise, so we're not getting hit with pages upon pages of uh, exposition dumps. Uh, but as it went on I realized that this is still pretty similar to the story of Aragon. Like, think about it, they both start off, find some source of crazy, powerful power, and then they have to go off and use it to save the day. And then th there's a couple other major story beats as well, which I won't get into here, but especially near the end, I was like, yeah, this is really similar to Aragon. It's like they compressed the entire inheritance cycle into one book, and that was... Th that was pretty disappointing. Like, a lot of the smaller details along the way are different, so it's not a complete retread, but still, when if you're expecting something totally new and original, you're gonna be disappointed here. However, even those smaller bits which are more original are a little clumsy. Like, this book, again, I liked it, but it really could have used some tightening up in the editing process, because it's a very long book, uh, it's like over 800 pages actually, and I wouldn't say it's super way too long. Like, it is a little too long, I think you could cut it down by like 5-10%, to 10 but mostly there's too much focus on some areas and not enough focus on other areas, and I would rather you swap those around. Like, for example, there's a lot of action scenes in this book, and most of them are fun, especially near the beginning and uh, at the very end. Like, the climax is really good in that regard. But there's a lot in the middle which are kind of small, and they just start to feel repetitive after a while. Like, it's just, oh, bad guys are doing things, heroes have to fight a little bit, but mostly they gotta escape so that they can go do other stuff. And so it's just a fighting retreat, basically. And I think if they had took two, maybe three of those and sort of combined them into one big scene, then it would have worked out better. And for another matter, the way that the characters are introduced in this is... Well, it ties into the story as well. It's just kind of clumsy. Like, see, Kira starts off on uh, one ship full of people, and those are people she's known for years, including her fiancé and others, 
And then um, she winds up having to go to a different ship full of uh, total strangers, and she has to learn how to get to know them over the course of this story. And the way they show that oftentimes is just, like there's one chapter in particular, which is just she goes around the ship talking to characters, and they each give the, her their long, in-depth backstory. And it's, um... Well, it feels off, because, like, why didn't she just keep it with her original ship and have it pe be people she already knew pretty well so that maybe in the narration somewhere she could put, this dude was always kind of a dick, but I knew he had a heart of gold, like, something like that, you know? So it would be a little shorter, a little tighter, and, I, I mean, if you wanted to have people, like, uh, die or get lost or something and Kira has to uh, use that as a motivation to keep going, then... You could still have her fiancé or something die, but have everyone else survive. Like, this way just feels like it's taking up a little too much space. That said, the cast is generally slightly above average. You know, uh, I liked how Kira was not really a damsel in distress. Uh, she figured out how to use her powers relatively quickly, uh, even if she does grow and grow more over the course of the story. And she, I don't know, she comes across as a decent enough person. And then the other members of her crew, like I said, the way they give their backstories is kind of clumsy, but the actual backstories themselves are neat, and they all have at least a little bit of personality, even if they aren't, like, the most amazing characters ever. They're, they're pretty cool. The only individual character I really connected with was this artificial intelligence named Grigorovich, who, I'm not gonna go too much into him, but he was a lot of fun because he's always just kind of unstable and you feel like he's right on the edge of snapping and killing everybody, which is just, I don't know, like I said, it's fun. It's uh, a little tense, but you never really feel like he's evil or anything, so it's not that bad. And uh, for that matter, I think the aliens are kind of cool. Like, this is one of the few science fiction books I've ever read where it really goes into how alien aliens can be. Like, these guys communicate using mostly uh, smell, actually, and so it's pretty much impossible for humans to talk to them at first. It takes a while before we can uh, really find a way to translate and communicate with them and figure out what's really going on here. And the villain, while he's not particularly... I, I mean, I don't know, he's kind of like Galvatorix in the sense that he doesn't really have a reason for doing anything that he does, but he is a pretty powerful, intimidating villain, so it worked out all right in the end. But as I said, the aliens are really alien. They have a completely different mindset, their biology, their culture. Everything is just difficult to wrap your head around. I mean, the only thing I've, uh, I can think of off the top of my head that where the aliens are even more alien than this is uh, in Gundam 00, where the aliens are literally just this big hive mind of living liquid metal, and they, it also has no concept of communication outside that hive mind, so it just goes around trying to absorb everything. Like, it's not even done out of malice. It's just how it operates, and yeah, it, it is really weird and bizarre. I think that's about it for the non-spoiler section. My overall thoughts, this book is a bit longer than it needs to be. It's a little clumsy, but uh, Paolini has definitely improved since he finished uh, Inheritance Cycle. Like, they're, the way uh, the prose is written and some of the descriptions, while they do occasionally go over the top, are better than they were back in the day, and Overall, I think if you're looking for some sort of science fiction space opera that isn't going to be like 20 books long, and you know, th this story is self-contained. It's not part of a series as far as I know. Like, it is open for a sequel, but it, it is self-contained. So if you're looking for something like that, I think you could maybe check this out. Uh, and if, it, if you hate it, then mm, I apologize. <laughs> oh, you're too much! So, now the spoiler section. The main thing I want to get in on with this is just the very end, and how it's exactly the same as the end of Aragon. Because, think about it, the very end of Aragon, they defeat Galbatorix, they defeat the evil force that was going to destroy the world, and then they start the rebuilding process. Aragon uh, has this several hundred pages, actually, of seeing how all of his friends end up, and it's usually pretty good. Like, Arya gets to be a queen and a dragon rider. His uh, dwarf friend gets to be king of the dwarves. Like, you know, it's it's uh, basically just showing off, hey, hey, everything worked out amazing for us. We're the good guys, everything's great. But at the same time, circumstances are forcing Aragon to uh, leave his home and never return. And to sleep in a sea of stars has kind of the same thing. Like, when Kira defeats the big bad, she winds up sort of 
becoming leader of this godlike being or hive mind type thing, and well, she becomes a godlike being. She brings an end to the fighting and defeats the bad guy and saves, in this case, not just the world, but the whole universe, and things are great. And then it goes around having her use her new powers to make everything amazing for her friends all of a sudden, like ones with genetic problems. Well, here's this thing. You just eat it once a day, it'll alle alleviate your symptoms and stuff like that. And again, it spends a little too long on it and it feels just a little too like, hey, everything, happy ending, everything's great now. So it is a little, a little cheesy and dumb. And then circumstances, again, force Kira to go off away from humanity forever. And well, it, it is basically just the ending of Aragon. And here's the thing, it's not the worst ending ever. Um, I'm actually one of the people who will defend the inheritance cycle because it showed how the evil king uh, doing all that damage doesn't go away overnight. But, yeah, it did feel a little forced when Aragon had to leave, and in this case, it feels a little less forced that Kira has to leave, but also, it does seem... Mm, I don't know how I should put this. Like, fantasy, generally speaking, is all about uh, great men. You know, individuals who go out and do crazy things and save the day themselves. Or, not completely themselves, but like, without them it wouldn't have happened. Whereas science fiction, in a lot of ways, is more about society and movements and how that sort of thing can change things. So the idea that this one woman who, again, not totally by herself, but without her it wouldn't have happened, uh, can go off and not only destroy the bad guy, but become this benevolent godlike being and make everything great just feels a little... I don't know, it feels a little too fantasy. And I know that Paolini is mostly a fan of fantasy literature, so I think that might be coloring it a little too much. It's not even that I hate fantasy, really, it's just that it feels kind of at odds with this science fiction thing where it's more about society and how that moves ahead, because the days of great men doing things are seemingly in the past. I don't know, maybe I'm being a little too pedantic here, but in this case it does feel a little bit worse, even though it's the same thing, and part of that is definitely just that I've seen this before and it's retreading old ground. So that's about all. Um, like I said earlier, I recommend it if you're really looking for space opera sci-fi with some fantasy elements, admittedly, uh, even if they don't really seem like fantasy elements at first. And, I don't know, I think that Paolini, if he continues to improve his craft, can really be one of the greats one day. Now is the time for the verbal shout-out for my $10 and up patrons. Apo Savalainen, B. Quinn, Brother Santodis, Christopher Quinten, Embis, Emily Miller, Evan Stigall, Joel, Karkat Kitsune, Madison Lewis Bennett, NB Star, Sad Mardigan, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, Vacuous Silas, and Vavictus. You guys are the best, as well as all the other names here. And if you want to get stuff like early access to my videos, and you can suggest new content, you want to get your name on here, then consider donating to my Patreon. And if you either can't do that, or you just hate me and don't want to do that, then, well, liking this video, commenting on it, and sharing it around really helps to get the word out. And even if you dislike it, that also boosts it in the algorithm. So really, no matter what, I win here. Uh, anyways, see you guys later.